Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kurt Francis this morning, standing in live for the wonderful Urschel, Urschel Metcalf, who does Urschel Speaks. Phenomenal guy, phenomenal friend of mine for, for nearly 20 years, or just about 20 years. He has impacted my life in a massive, massive way. So it is a privilege for me to be on with all of you this morning. I'm really stood up to be, I'm in California at 6 a.m. this morning, and wherever you are, if you're in Central Time, it's 8 a.m. or East Coast, 9 a.m., wherever you go, but it's still, still early up here in California. But what a pleasure it is to get up this morning and to spend time with, with you people. So Ursho asked me to, to step in because he's got an engagement that he, they cannot get out of this morning. So uh, welcome. So uh, my name is Kurt Francis. I, you know, people always ask me, uh, wherever I go, they ask me, so where are you from? And I tell them, well, I'm from San Diego. And they say, well, you know, your, your accent doesn't sound like it. And so I'm originally from South Africa, which makes me an African-American without a tan. That's, 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 that's perhaps who I am, African-American without a tan. But I've been in this great country for about 20 years. And of course, we've seen a lot come in and go out and changes and from you know, 9-11 till, till, you know, the fall, uh, you know, the global uh, Great Recession in 2008. And of course, what we're going through right now is COVID. We're all going through stuff. Everybody's going through stuff. You know what I'm learning is that, what I'm learning is that it doesn't matter who you are. There's somebody that's got less than you've got. There's somebody that's got less than you've got. No matter what you're going through, no matter what issues you've got, no matter what pain you've got, somebody there's somebody else there with more pain. No matter, you know, no matter how difficult your situation is, there's always somebody else who is in a worse position. That that's what it is. It's very interesting. Just when we think that we've got it really bad and very rough, I mean, what happened when when COVID nineteen happened, I. When started, I just returned from South Africa. I'd, I'd been traveling a lot in the beginning of the year, I'd speaking engagements around the country, flying in cities, flying out of cities, and and you know just all over you know, California. Then it was you know Reno, and then it was Vegas, and then it was uh, back here then Los Angeles, and got back you know one day and the next day I had to leave for South Africa, and I, I got in South Africa right there, and there was zero cases of COVID. It is just the beginning in the States. Very, very few um, still cases there, but zero cases in South Africa. And I was there for two weeks. By the time I left, there were seven cases. And now South Africa is number five in the list of the most cases. Little South Africa is number five in the world with the most cases. Really interesting. And But when I flew back, the, you know, it was it was still fine. We, we had a number of things happen. We, we, we had a car accident. Like a few days after arriving back from South Africa, some guy hit us at over 100 miles an hour on the freeway. Just just hit us, 100 miles an hour on the freeway. And and he didn't stop. He didn't stop. And a long story short is that we chased him. He pushed the car off on the, on the one side of the freeway, dodging like that, went on this exit. We took it as well, followed him. And the exit becomes two lanes. Well, he got in the fast lane on the left-hand side, but guess what happened? The traffic stopped and he got stuck, and we came around him and cornered him off like that. And he eventually, you know, um, my spouse was on the phone with 911, and I got out the car to see him, and he said, this is my mother's car, this is my mother's car. Uh, let's just go down the road. Don't call the police. Let's just go down the road. And I said to him, it's too late. We're already on the phone with the police. It's too late. We're already on the phone. With the police and he said no no please please don't it's my mother's car whatever and he was a kid about 25 years old not a kid is an adult it's an adult 25 years old and guess what happens he he um he, I'm, i tried to take a picture of the license plate of the car and he kept on putting his hands in the way of me taking a picture of the license plate he kept on doing that to try and stop me and then he, he started getting really aggressive and then he ran, he ran, and I thought, is he going to get a gun or what's he going to do? And he ran and got in the car and he tried to start this Camaro that's only about two years old. And every two-year-old car that I know that starts, but this car wouldn't start. Didn't start. And then and I was relieved. I thought he was going to get a gun. 
and I was looking at my spouse through the window where my spouse was talking to 911. And then he got out the car and he ran away, left us, ran away. Never planned to tell the story this morning. But I'm just telling you that, you know, that's what, that's what happens, right? That's what happens. And uh, then the police came. But just before the police came, there was a girl in the car, maybe his girlfriend. And then she got out and ran away as well. And so we've had some interesting things happen. And I won't get into all the details with insurance and that about that situation. The police, I don't want to share that with you, but it's a longer, longer story. And it gets intense. But we are well. We're safe, right? There's always somebody going worse. I mean, maybe he could have shot us. Maybe, you know, because he was aggressive. And things could have gone much worse, far more worse. That's what could have happened. Okay. And then... About six weeks ago, we were assaulted in a place called Pacific Beach in California. And that's another story that just in the street, um, people were causing unnecessary drama for normal citizens and wouldn't let them park in a place, stop them from parking. Like crazy, right? And they were harassing these two young ladies and then another family with two little kids. And... Uh, and I said, you can't do that. And nobody was doing anything. And we called 911, police came. And what happened? They had left by then. And they came back. They came back too early. And But before that, they had assaulted us and actually, you know, threw a few fists. We didn't respond. We chose not to. And the thing is with this story is that he has a young guy about 25 years old who's who's causing a lot of havoc and drama in the streets. Wouldn't let people park in a place. This is what he wouldn't do. He was holding the parking place for a friend for over 15 minutes. And two young ladies in the Mini Cooper and then another family and somebody else and then another car, four cars. And was aggressive. He stood in front of the Mini Cooper and said, just ride me over, ride me over. Come on, ride me over. And just creating this aggressive thing. And his girlfriend was was harassing the woman through their window in the Mini Cooper. They just drove off. They were so nervous. They didn't know what was going to ha happen. So this is live. I'm talking live, right? We're telling you the story of what can happen out there. But the, the, the true power of the story is this, that we felt they did a citizen's arrest. The police came. And... We, so what a citizen's citizen arrest is, they don't physically arrest you, but you, you go down as you were arrested. And we, we decided not to do that, not to create any more havoc in the streets and different things that were happening on the streets at that time. And it was a Sunday morning. You know, it was early in the morning. But what we decided is that we would drop all charges from the assault and a few other things that were said that were totally uncalled for. So we decided that we... We'll drop the, drop the charges if this young man sits with me and says, Kurt, you know, I'm sorry what happened and my life's messed up and I want to get it uh, right. And I'll, I'm prepared to have four sessions with him, which I normally charge a lot of money for that. Um, I would give him free four sessions to help this young man get his life on the path because his aggression in the street of assaulting us physically and then verbally assaulting and bringing a lot of fear in public. And we decided that that's what we would do. We will, in an incredible way, feel, how did it turn a negative into a positive? You know, we could just go through the court and whatever, and he can get the thing against him, his name, whatever, and have that attached to him. But what about this? What about us, rather? What about us, rather, showing grace? and helping somebody and perhaps changing this man's trajectory in his life in his life right what do you think what do you think and somebody said well Kurt no you know you should teach him a lesson he should he should you know go to jail for that he should I'm not I'm not sure that the jail is the best place for everybody and I think that I could have far more effect on a man's life if he just humbles himself and asks forgiveness 
and what he says and what he did. And then let me sit down with him for about four sessions. That's that's my thinking of of it. You know, it's the same guy. I mean, the same the same story as the guy who hit us on the freeway at over 100 miles an hour, cost over 10,000 damage on my car. And would we show him grace? I'm drinking coffee, my homemade coffee is this topic, with, with a straw. Because I was about to do a presentation last week, and I went like that, and the coffee went over my shirt just before doing a presentation. So, I'm not ever drinking coffee again like that. I'm just drinking out of a straw if I'm going to drink, well, out of these kind of mugs. Okay. That's, if, you, if, you, if it looks funny with me drinking a straw from coffee or you think, well, what, what's really in there? It is coffee. It's coffee. But the straw helps me. So this morning I want to talk a little bit about how to close more sales even if you are a lousy closer. How to close more sales even if you're a lousy closer. So I'm going to share my screen with you right now, and I'm going to um, enter screen. Ding ding. Okay, uh, there it is. Okay, I'm going to show you that, and I'm going to show you that. So you should be able to see that um, on your screen. I hope you. Hopefully, you can. I'm trying to see on on Jan Urschel's. I'm not sure if it's going live. I'm not sure if this is going live right now. It says going live, but I'm going to um, go for it. So how to close more sales, even if you're a lousy closer. And that's what I'm really passionate about. I love talking about and really helping people. And let's be really clear what we're we'll looking at today is how to close more sales, even if you are a lousy closer. You see the three big false beliefs that's holding all of us back, all of us. And uh, basically, you know, from getting the results that you really deserve, what the nation's top 1% of marketers and entrepreneurs know about closing transactions and that 99% of agents and entrepreneurs and small business owners don't know. And in, even if you say, well, Kurt, I'm not a business owner, we still do business. All of us does business. We, you know, we hire a plumber in, we hire um, someone to, to help us, electricians, whatever it is, we, we're all doing business and we've got to understand our entrepreneurs thing. And I'll never forget an agent called me from Los Angeles. He works on the affluent market. In Los Angeles, and he said, Kurt, I'm stuck, I'm agitated, I'm overwhelmed, and I cannot have a breakthrough, you know, that I want to go to the next level. Please help me. And I said, well, let's just look about the first false beliefs. And the first false belief is all about positioning, the way we position ourselves. Even a little kid, if a kid wants, you know, their parents to buy candy, they position themselves to ask. A little child knows that four or five years old. A child will know how to position themselves you know, so the parents can actually you know, buy some candy or they're going to throw a tantrum, right? And the kids that are effective, they know how to position themselves. And my question to you, you know, what industry have you positioned yourself in? And a lot of people tell me, okay, I've positioned myself in sales. You know, you may be a school teacher. Um, to be honest with you, in a way, we're all selling ourselves. In a way, we, we've got to. If you're trying to get a job and you put a resume, you're trying to sell yourself. If you're trying to persuade somebody to, to work with you in a team, you are actually in a way so-called selling yourself, okay? And we and this is how we look at things. We taught to look at things. So we tell people, um, you know, how do we how, you know how do you position yourself? What kind of position you're in? What industry? And people often say sales. We sales industry. But I want to tell you that most of us are not in sales. Very very few people in sales. Probably the only person in sales is a person sitting at a checkout counter in a grocery store, okay? or i um, at a cell phone store, okay? Um, the person who's actually right in front when they're about to pay for something, that's when sales happens. So I worked with a great agent, okay? Great agent with excellence. His name is Jonathan. And Jonathan is guy is a master closer, phenomenal, closing ratio of 90%. So if somebody gets in front of him, if somebody gets in front of him as, you know, as a real estate agent, he will close 90% of people, which is a high closing ratio. Even the top people say he's a master closer. So Jonathan is something else, okay? And closing ratio of 90%, he sees 10 people per quarter. He's got a, he goes on 10 listing appointments per quarter, okay? And he closes nine, nine, nine out of the 10, which is 90%, and he earns $10,000 per, per, you know, per transaction. 
And so in my times, that is $90,000 per quarter. Now, I think that's a great, that's a great income, right? And that's a great income. But remember, you know, he always tells people he's in the sales industry. And that's what Jonathan tells everybody. Now, another great agent with excellence, Darren. I've worked with Darren for a long time, and I love this guy. He's amazing. Darren is not a master closer. Darren, the guy I love, is not a master closer. In fact, his closing ratio is only at 50%. Not like Jonathan's. Jonathan's at 90%. But, but, but you know, Darren is at 50%. But I love this guy. He's an amazing guy. Okay. So these are the two. One closes at 90%, Jonathan, and Darren closes at 50%. Big difference, right? So Jonathan's earning $90,000 a quarter. But Darren, the lousy closer, what do you think he's earning? Well, closing ratio, only 50%. But he doesn't see 10 appointments. He sees 60 appointments, 60 people per quarter. That's right. So with a bad closing ratio of 50%, he only closes 30 people, 30 people out of 60. But 30 people is more than the mine that Jonathan's closing. And he earns $10,000 per transaction. So he's only $300,000 a quarter. That's what Darren's earning. And he's the lousy closer. So what is it? How do you close more transactions even if a lousy closer? You see, so who do you identify with? Now, I'm not going to show this video, but let me just speak to you about Todd. Todd took seven months before he sold his first home when he got into real estate uh, uh, industry. And people said to him, oh, just give it up. You know, forget about it. He, from, he, he went from closing zero in seven months to a master closer, number, t number one in the company. Why? Because he understood the principle we're talking about. And his business exploded. Now, he tells a story, but I'm going to skip over to the next slide. We're not going to listen to it just for time. I know him, as. Yes, Tony Elias. Tony Elias was earning forty thousand dollars a year, and I said, "Tony, you got the potential to earn one point four or one million dollars a year." And and uh, last year he earned one point four million dollars. Okay, how do you go from forty thousand to one one thousand uh, or one point four million? Each year we. And I'm not going to go through that video. Well, let me te let me just go through some things, and we can use this in in negotiating. If you're buying a house, if you're buying a car. Uh, you know, whatever, just we've got to think of these things and understand them. We've got to think like a golf champion, okay? And a golf champion, you know, basically knows that 80% of the time it's getting the ball down the fairway. It's about getting the ball down the fairway. That's 80% of the time. You've got to knock the ball from the tee to the green down the fairway. You've got to get the ball from the tee to the green. That's 90% of the time, okay? And only 20% of the time is actually on the green. Okay, there's Tiger Woods winning Augusta what, last year or the year before. And they swing it on the, the left-hand side. And the other one is on, the other picture is on the green. Like the green is like sales and then marketing is getting the ball down the green. That's, that's what the marketing is. And the results of great marketing and sales is this time. When you, when, you, when you mess both, when you've got great marketing and you've got great sales, you get a great ending. And that's when you win, Right. So sales only happens to people when people are in front of you, okay? That's when sales happens. Well, sales only happens when people are in front of you online on the phone. So you've got to get them on the phone. This is the thing that Darren understands. Uh, Jonathan didn't fully understand this, although he's a master closer. It's all about positioning. Do you position yourself as a salesperson or do you position yourself as a marketing person? So, and, and it doesn't matter what industry we're in, you see, we we are all we're all selling ourselves. We're all trying to influence someone. And I love using the, the school teacher example because my sister is a great school teacher and influenced many people and kids around all over the world. And uh, what she does is very very interesting in the way she serves people. But even as even a teacher or head of a department or principal or headmaster, when you're trying to convince somebody, persuade somebody in any job, you know you all you've you've got something different that somebody else does not have. And that's why sometimes when you know it and believe it, you've got to kind of reposition yourself, correct? So position yourself to sell. Marketing positions yourself to sell. That's what marketing does. Marketing positions you to serve first. You first got to market yourself before selling. And people often try and sell first before the market, but you cannot. You first got to position yourself to market. And no matter what industry, you're marketing yourself. Okay? If you're applying for a new job, you're marketing yourself. And you've got to position yourself first. You've got to position, position yourself as a marketer before you're a suspect. Okay? You first get a suspect, and then you get a prospect, and then you get a customer, and then you get a client. And that's the order that comes in. I won't get into that this morning, but, 
But marketing, you've got to market yourself. And that's a problem. A lot of people don't know how to market themselves. Marketing positions your suspect to become a prospect. Marketing prepares your prospect to buy. Okay? And they say, well, Kurt, I'm not, I'm not selling stuff. I'm a teacher. Well, you've got to convince your other teachers to think in a certain way for decisions. Should kids come back to school or not? Or, you know, how are we going to do, you know, sporting activities right now? How are we going to do Zoom calls or video? You know, you might have to convince other teachers. Okay? So, so you don't try, you don't just, you just sell them on what you're doing. That's the worst thing. You first got to market what you're doing. They like, could, I don't even understand this. This is how we've got to change our thinking in every area of our life. So, marketing prepares your suspect to buy. Um, if you're a teacher, we need to we first market what you're doing um, and who you are before you try and get them to buy into your plan. Prospects love to buy, but hate to be sold. There's a Jeffrey Gittimer quote. Slightly changed. Marketing earns you the right to sell. Marketing gives you the right to convince somebody. You see, marketing is about giving what people want, and sales is about them getting what they need. Very two different approaches. And this is why a lot of people fail at sales. They fail at persuasion. They fail at influencing. They fail at converting somebody because they don't understand that marketing is giving people what they want, but sales is getting what they need. So, Position yourself to sell. Look at those positions of those people out there. Position yourself to sell through effective marketing. That's how we do it. We're going to stop trying to sell before you, you know, before you have before before you have what? Position yourself to sell. And even when you try to persuade somebody or convince somebody or bring them on, you first go to market yourself and position yourself to sell. Don't sell if you haven't positioned yourself. Earn the right to sell. Okay, stop trying to sell before you've earned the right. You've got to earn the right to sell something. An incubation, okay? This happens when it's premature. Selling before you have earned the right to sell is like premature birth, okay? That's a big one. It results in complications. You know, that we know that premature birth results in a lot of complications, and it extends the process. The person's in the hospital a lot longer, and it creates an intensive care protocol. So we... Don't, if you're persuading somebody or influencing somebody or, or you think you want to close on them, the worst thing is to do is prematurely close on them. You first go to market. Okay? So imagine the golfer spending their time putting down the fairway, putting, putting down the fairway. Okay? Imagine, look, when you're trying to get the ball from the tee to the green, you can't putt the whole way. You can't do that, and you're never going to get there. You've got to stop the putting, and you've got to what? You've got to use the right golf club, the right iron, and knock the hell out of that ball and make sure that it's accurate and, and get it you know, between the trees, whatever, and down the fairway and onto the green. Okay? The problem is that a lot of people, they, they're trying to putt all the way down. They're not using the right golf clubs. They're not using the right iron. Okay? They're not, not right using the sales techniques. Why? Because sales is on the green. Let me just go back. Sales is on the green, but marketing is getting the ball to the green. Sales is on the green, but marketing is getting the ball to the green. You see, putting with the wrong golf clubs, this is what most people battle with. When people are trying to influence somebody, persuade somebody, they're using the wrong golf clubs. They're using putting clubs instead of using the iron that's getting get you down the fairway. We've got to use sales tools well, I mean, using sales tools when they are supposed to use marketing tools, okay? And this is the same for all negotiation. No matter what industry you're in, this is the big problem that 91% of salespeople are, are, do not earn an income worth talking about, 91%, okay? So if you don't have anybody to see, then it doesn't matter how good closer you are. Jonathan can be a master closer at 90%. It doesn't matter because if there's nobody in front of you, then what's used to be a master closer? You can be the bull's best closer. You can even have a degree in closing. Yep. You can even have a degree in closing techniques, like some people have. You can have a master degree in closing techniques. You can have so many degrees that you look like a thermometer. That's a joke. Okay, that's a joke. So it doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter if you've downloaded every sales script. You can have every sales script memorized. You can have every sales script with the smartest closing techniques. But if you don't have people in front of you, it's worth nothing. Some people are just plain putt-putt. 
they just playing mini golf. They're playing putt putt. When that's if you've seen Tiger Woods practice for hours and hours playing mini golf. No, he's not doing that. Because the most of it is to get the ball down, down the fairway, down from the tee to the green. So I want to show you something here. If you look at this slide, okay, if you look at this slide, very, very interesting. All those dots are exactly the same. They're all exactly the same. They're the same size, they're the same color. Which dot did you see first? Okay, you saw the dot outside. Okay, there are 42 dots. Okay, 42 dots, and one of them, so 2.38% of them, you saw that one first. You didn't see the, the you know, the, the 90, uh, you know, 90, 90, uh, you know, What's ninety seven percent? Okay, ninety seven point four percent. You didn't see that. What you saw is the two point three. You didn't see ninety seven percent of them. You never saw first. You missed the ninety seven percent, but you did see the two point eight. Why? Because they positioned themselves differently. They positioned themselves higher than them. They're the same color. Every dot's the same color. Same size. Same everything, except the positioning. And this is what we've got to do. We've got to learn. We've got to position ourselves. Okay, the first boss for you, so they think they are in sales, people. That's the biggest problem. Are you positioning yourself as the best closer or the best marketer? No matter what industry you are in, you say, Kurt, I don't sell anything physically, that's fine. But you've got to position yourself, okay, and you've got to market yourself in whatever you do. The second false belief, okay, is how they present themselves. Okay, people believe they can just present themselves anywhere. Now, I'm seeing a lot of Zoom calls, right? I'm shocked and blown away with the lousy level of presentations that are out there. These are professional people I'm seeing deliver lousy messages. And not just the, the content's lousy, but more the presentation is lousy. And that's what I'm more concerned about. Because what I've learned about a presentation is that you can have the world's best content and share that out there. But if you present it boringly, nobody cares. And that's the thing, you see, you can be the world's smartest person, but you can present it slowly on one more tone and there's have no excitement in it. And people don't know how to present. And I'm seeing it. I, I see it all the time, every time. And a number of things. So I won't get into that right now. Presenting oneself as a salesperson, not as a marketer. Okay, we've got to present ourselves as a marketer instead of a salesperson. And this is it's all the way we present ourselves. And 91% of entrepreneurs present themselves as what they do. I want to say, even if you're a lecturer, professor at a university, people always present themselves what they do. Very interesting. When I travel, I'm always asking people about who they are. And they start telling me what they do. And let me tell you something now. People don't care about what, what you do. People don't care about what you do. And this is what 91% of people are presenting themselves as what they do. And people don't care about what they do because people don't buy what you do. People buy who you are. People don't buy what you do. People buy who you are and stop presenting yourself as what you do. And I don't care if you're a doctor, a nurse, a mechanic, a professor, a teacher, um, a cell phone salesperson, a real estate agent, financial advisor, wealth manager, a banker, a car salesman, accountant, I don't care. People don't buy what you do, they buy who you are. And this is what you've got to, got to look at. So presenting yourself as who you are. So who are you? Who are you? Most people can't tell me who they are when I meet them. They cannot tell me who are you. When I ask them who are you, they like, or if I ask them to write down who they are, it's really interesting. Now, November the 7th, 2005, I was appointed as a manager of a rested office and I was really so excited. I was really, really stirred up to be introduced to this office and this company and all the agents. And it was very, very interesting what happened because the CEO calls me up to the front of the room and said, this is your new manager, Kurt Francis. He's got a lot of energy and he really wants to help you. And I said, good morning, everybody. But as I was walking up to the front on the stage, I saw people crossing their arms sneering at me, looking like that, and all closed, whatever. And as I started saying, um, I'm really excited to be here and to help you grow your business, some old man slams his fist down on the table and says, 
and stands up and says, who the hell are you, boy? Who the hell are you? To come in here to take Ron's place. Very interesting, right? And wow, what a welcome. What a welcome. And many of the people in the room left and walked out that day. And I will never forget it. That was my great welcome, right? Never forget it. So the words of who the hell are you? You know, he, he said to me, he said, you young whippersnapper, how long have you had your license? Because I was, you know, I was in my 30s. And these guys are in their 50s, 60s. And they thought, well, you know, ha, ha, ha. So I'm dyslexic, very dyslexic. Can't see a difference between a three and an E and a B and a D and a six and a nine. You guess what? I wrote a book and my book became an Amazon bestseller. And that's another story and a half, what really happened there. And I had three weeks and I wrote that book in four days, four days. And the story basically goes that I was about to go to CNN and I couldn't go to CNN. Um, well, my coach said to me, we're coaching um, all the people going and there were 15 of us. And he said, Kurt Francis, tonight on a little Zoom call a few years ago, Kurt Francis, we're going to unmute you uh, unmute you, and we're going to create your segment proposal that you're going to push before television producers, ABC, CW, CBS, NBC, across this nation. So let's start with what's the title of your book? And I said, uh, uh, well, my book's not out yet. Now, I'd never finished a book in my life because I'm so dyslexic. I'd always battled to read. And in South Africa, they didn't have tests those days that you were dyslexic. It's only years later that I found out, found out about it. I knew there was a problem. The teachers thought I was the problem. So what happened is, yeah, I'm, I mean, everybody look at me, watch me. And the, some coach says, so Kurt, what's the title of your book? And I said, my book's not out yet. He said, well, when's it going to be out? He, I said, 2019. He said, no, it's not. You're not going to CNN without a book. And that's not going to happen. By next week, I want a title, I want a cover, and so it's got, got to be off to the publishers. Long story short, um, the day after I finished with the five days and, at CNN, I launched my book and it was publishing that day. And Maria Shriver, Arnold Schwarzenegger's uh, wife, ex-wife, was the launch of the book, and she was number four position, and I was number five. I was number five and I overtook her and I was number one on Amazon for one whole year Ugh, one, one t for 10 days for 10 days number one on Amazon so I got become an Amazon bestseller it is amazing never expected that I worked for it but I, I was just kind of hoping but it did happen right so we created a strategy to do that so who the hell am I to write a book and be bestseller I've never even read a book so people say well how many books do you read well how many books do I write okay but I do listen to other um, audiobooks. So who the hell am I to speak at Harvard Club of Boston in front of 125 executives, CEOs, doctors doing phenomenal research and high-powered attorneys from New York City? How, how do, I mean, come on, somebody. How do a person who never finished university, okay, gets to speak at a prestigious uh, event like that? George Ross, who was, who was a judge on The Apprentice, the Donald Trump show, The Apprentice, and who's actually... Donald Trump's executive vice president for um, his real estate division for 47 years. Okay, and he was Donald Trump's attorney. And uh, so interesting when I interviewed him, he said, you can ask me anything, just don't ask me about the Donald's hair. Don't ask me about the Donald's hair. That's what he said. Who am I to be interviewing Kate and Jenna at the Harvard Club of Boston? I'm amazing. Uh, that's just, who am I to go on television across the nation? Who am I to be on NBC? Okay. So, you know, say, who am I? Who the hell are you? Who the hell are you, Kurt, to do these things? Who the hell are you to come here, you young whippersnapper? You see, who are you presenting yourself as? Okay, that's the question I've got. You know, who am I to, to be on the Jumbotron and become 75 feet tall in New York, in Times Square? 30 years ago, did I ever believe I'll be on NASDAQ's Jumbo screen? Did I ever believe that? You know, absolutely not. Never believed that. And there I was. And then, who am I to speak at the Million Dollar Accelerator at NASDAQ? Who am I? Never imagined that would happen. Who the hell am I? Okay. So firstly, let me go back to that thing. Um, who the hell are you? Ask yourself the question. Who are you? Okay. Well, you are precious and you're wonderful and you've got so much to give. You've got so much to give in your life. That's what you've got. You see, people compensate you not for what you do. 
People don't get paid for what they do. People get paid for who they are. People get paid for who they are. Let's never forget that. So how do we increase our salary? How do we get to another position? It's not what you do. It's who you are inside. And I won't get into that, that detail right now about that, but I would love to. The biggest mistake in presentation is never meet anybody ever. Never, ever meet anybody ever. Never, ever meet anybody ever in person, on a phone call, online, on a Zoom call, unless they know who you are. This is the biggest mistake we all do when we present. If you go and see an attorney, if you go and see a doctor, just about anybody, if you go and meet somebody or you're trying to persuade them, well, don't meet them unless they know who you are. Not what you do. Not what you do. Everyone say, well, I do that. I tell them what I do. No, I'm not. Don't, don't tell people what you do because people don't care what you do. People care who you are. So how do we do this? Okay. We're not approaching marketing as a presentation because it's all about marketing, right? Marketing is about giving people what they want and sales is about people getting what they need. No digital marketing strategy. People don't know how to, you know, um, market themselves even before somebody meets them. They don't know what platforms to use. They don't know which, which days they should present on which platforms, what time of the day, paid or organic ads on which platforms. People just don't know that. They don't have a marketing budget. Even if you're applying for a job, you better have a marketing budget to market yourself. Okay, people just throw a resume and I think that's going to do it. That's not going to cut it. That's not going to cut it. People just, you know, send people a, a, a marketing piece and think they're going to sign up. That It doesn't work like that. No digital marketing strategy. So how do I stream? Which streaming platform should I use? What angle do I hold the device? When should I do lives? What microphone should I use? I mean, there's all these different things. Not presenting an offer in your marketing process. And when you market yourself, present an offer. Okay. If you don't make an offer every day, you're not in business, okay? If you don't market yourself every day, you're not growing in your career. You've got to market yourself. I don't care if you're an administrator. I don't, I don't care. I don't care if you're an executive assistant. If you, you've got to be making offers every single day. Sometimes it's offer to serve people because man, marketing is about serving and marketing is giving people what they want. So what kind of offer are we making every single day? The, I call it the IIO. Well, that's not the speed limit in London. The 110 kilometers? No. The IIO is this. The irrefutable and irresistible offer. We've got to make an irrefutable, irresistible offer. But people have never been taught this. Wherever I go, across the United States, across the world, I always ask, tell me, have you had training on the seven segments of an irrefutable and irresistible offer? How do you create the seven segments of an irrefutable and irresistible offer? Do you know what they are? And people say, no, they've never had training on this. And it amazed me. Most salespeople have never had training on this all over the world. It doesn't matter what industry they're in. In fact, we should, nobody should graduate from high school unless they know this because we all are marketing ourselves. We should be. The first false belief is misconception, okay? And um, people, you know, people don't believe that they need to create an ace perception. What's a, well, let me look at the perception, right? We've got to position ourselves. We've got to present ourselves and create the perception, three Ps. People don't buy what you do. Remember that. They, people buy their perception of who you are. People buy who you are, and it's their perception of that. People don't buy what you do. They buy who you are, the perception of it. People buy what you are perceived as, okay? People buy their perception of you, of, what, of who you are, and what you are becoming. People don't buy, if you're not becoming anything, people don't buy that. People buy what you are perceived as, okay? If their perception is, you know, good of you, and if the perception is that you can describe their pain better than they can, they see you as a solution. If you can describe their pain better than they can, they see you as a solution, no matter what you do, no matter who you're trying to help. So never meet anybody unless they know who you are. Okay, so what do you do and how to do it? Well, perception of you before they meet you. That's so critical, ladies and gentlemen. That is so critical. So like Darren and Jonathan, okay, one is a master closer and the other one not, but Darren outperforms. So what happened to Todd? You know, it's seven, I mean, seven months to sell his first home, you know, and then how to become the company number one. How did Tony become the Tony we know today? It's like tennis, you see, it's like tennis. If you serve an ace, what happens? The one who serves the fastest wins and the one who positions the ball wins. So you, that's why you've got to position yourself as, as what? as an ace authority, celebrity, and an expert. 
how do we do that? Because you are the ball. You're going to place the ball, right? Um, so, you know, what do we do? Okay, you've got to position yourself, present yourself, and be perceived as an ace. Ace stands for authority, celebrity, and expert. How do we do that? How do we very? How do we do that? Very, very interesting. So, Dr. Oz says, celebrity powerful is status. People tend to trust celebrities to the level that they would trust their families and sometimes even more than their families. And opinions of celebrities seem to matter. So it's not your fault that you don't even know this stuff because we never taught this stuff at school and companies don't even teach this stuff. The biggest mistake people make as well is the first 20 minutes of an appointment, people tell, people tell what they do. They always tell people what they do. And like your business card is a, is a marketing piece. And guess what people do in the marketing piece? They do this all the time. In the marketing piece, they tell people what do they do. They give their title. People don't care what you do. They care who you do. So really how to do this, and I've got a, I've got a, uh, I've got a program that I could tell you if you want to look at it. Um, I don't want to go through it right now, but I will definitely be able to share, share that sometime. And I'm just trying to look at this. Let me, uh, uh, how do I go back to, I'm trying to get rid of sharing. Um, okay, there it is. So ladies and gentlemen, that's a little bit about that. And we've got to look at ourselves and look at our life, you know, in a, in a, in a big way. So how to close more transactions or how to close more sales even if you're a lousy closer. Now, we are all closing, okay? And people, you can, you know, you can always say we're all in sales. You've got to sell yourself to your spouse when you go on a date or whatever. You, well, actually, it's marketing. It's not really sales. It's marketing. You've got to market yourself first. When, you, when, you, when you're trying to, you know, go on a date with somebody and you've got to say some good things about yourself online or however you do it, you've got to market yourself. That's, market. That's not sales. You're not selling yourself. You've got to first market yourself, Okay. And you give people what they want, but when you sell something, you, you give them what they need. And it's like dating, right? Dating, you kind of give them people what they want. What are they looking for? Especially if you like somebody. And let's be real now. If you like somebody, you're really trying to, you know, attract them. You're going to give them what they want. People do this all the time. But human beings, we do this. That's marketing. Sales is when you get married and you sign the contract. And that's when you actually give them what they need, not just what they want. So that's, that's me today for Urshel. Urshel Speaks. And keep on watching 8 a.m. Central Time every Tuesday when Urshel impacts this world in a massive, big way, like more than you will ever realize. That guy, what he's done for me and my life over the years is incredible. He, he showed me grace and humility and understanding when other people walked away from me. He stood by me as a friend. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that what he's done. That's why I endorse Urshel Metcalf all the time because he's got things inside him that a lot of people don't. And he's not here this morning. He's in meetings. that has got to be, couldn't get out of. But now's my opportunity to tell all his fans that how I love him. I love his wife. I think they're amazing people. And your life will be impacted in an incredible way. So I did was on a guest in my show recently. And it's so funny what another, another person said, um, wow, Kurt, you were right. He can articulate so well. He can explain. He can tell a story. So, yes, he can. He's a master at that. He's a master at telling a story. He's a master at loving people. He's a master in leadership. He's a master at persuading people to do the right thing in the midst of him being challenged, him being challenged throughout his whole life. He's been charged. He was my spinning instructor in class in spinning in North Carolina. And wow, could that guy, that guy's still the, probably the best spinning instructor I've had in my life. I've never had a person who invigorated me so much in a class. And when I walked out the class, I knew I'd done a class. I knew I'd done been in spinning class. Some spinning classes you go to, you don't even know you've been in one. But with Urshel, you come up there, you could be down, depressed, and whatever. You walk out of that class, you feel like a new human being. And you burnt like five to eight hundred calories, okay, in one hour. Yep, I've seen him lead worship on stages. I've seen him preach. I've seen him talk. I've seen him help people be down and out on pavements and sidewalks. 
That's who Osho is. And if there's anybody who's earned the right to speak, it is Osho Speaks. It is Osho Metcalf who has earned the right to just about say anything he wants because I know his heart and I know the way he served people for many, 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 many years. I know what his wife means to him. I know what his kids mean to him. I know his outlook in life. Always wanting to contribute. Always want to give. Always want to share. There are few people, not everybody's like that in life. Not everybody's like that. So how do you position yourself? Okay. How do you present yourself? And thirdly, what perception have you created in the eyes of your suspect? When number one, prospect number two, number three is customer, number four, client. You say, okay, what's the difference between all of those? Well, a suspect is somebody just, you're a suspect. They're sussing you out, like you're sussing me out. You're a suspect, okay? You, you've got suspects. They've got no allegiance to you. They've got no relation with you. They're sussing you out, okay? They are sussing you out. You've been sussed out every single day by the suspects. So to get somebody to become a suspect to a prospect, it's all about marketing. How do you market yourself? How do you position yourself? How do you present yourself? And what perception are you creating for them to move them from being a suspect as they sus you out to a prospect? Then a prospect is somebody that's, oh, okay, um, I'm going to agree to meet with Kurt. Okay, I will meet with Kurt. And then they meet with me and they become a customer. Okay, but there's no written contract there. And from a customer to a client is when you have actually a written contract. And say, I'm going to, I'm doing business with you. I'm agreed. I'm paying you so much. This is going to happen. And that's, that's the difference between a client and a customer. So we go suspect, prospect, customer, client. And the client is the end result. We've actually got it, got it, got it. Uh, you've got some agreement. Maybe it's not always in writing. The agreement may be verbally, right? Have you drunk coffee out of a straw before? And I saw somebody do that thing crazy. It was my spouse. I thought, you crazy, drink coffee out of Now I know. After messing my shirt before going live on a presentation for coffee last week, I will always drink out of a straw. So, yeah, I'm in San Diego, California. And I am a, who am I? You know, I'm an award-winning speaker. I'm a best-selling author. I'm a master strategist. And I'm a lifelong whippersnapper. That's what I'm, I'm a whippersnapper because when that old man said to me in 2005, who the hell are you, boy, you young whippersnapper? And I thought, that's a cool name, whippersnapper. That's my title. I'm a whippersnapper. I'm a lifelong whippersnapper. What is a whippersnapper? A whippersnapper is, I don't know what a whippersnapper was. In Africa, we never used that word. But those days, we never did. But a whippersnapper is some young person who's very confident. He's very confident. Okay? And I want to say to you that, Become a, life, a lifelong whippersnapper. Be confident. And it's don't look at your earth suit, otherwise your body, and determine how old you are. It's all about, yeah, it's all in your mind. It's all in your mind. That's where it is. And become a young whippersnapper, life, life, lifelong whippersnapper. Now, if I'm 80 years old, I'm a whippersnapper. And you say, well, okay, that's not the truth. Oh, let me tell you. You want to talk about that? I know people that have been in the real estate industry for 40 years and they're falling out of the industry right now because they th they've been here too long and they don't know how to reinvent themselves and they're not thinking like a brand new agent. Every week you've got to think like a brand new agent. How's the market changing? How's our culture changing? Or, or, you know, what technology is changing? What strategies are changing? And if you don't have the lifelong whippersnapper attitude, you're going to be, find yourself out of business and people don't want to hire you on. Oh, good, I'm 60 years. Nobody wants to hire me on. So whose fault is that? Whose fault is that? Now, it can be a number of things. It could be maybe you work for a company for 30 years, 35 years, and it just suddenly let you go. Okay. And you can be a victim and blame the company, blame everything, blame the government, blame whatever. Or you can pick up your life and change it and find and recreate yourself because 60 is the new 40. 70 is the new 50. That's it. That's it. So I don't care your age. I don't care if you're 18 years old. I don't care if you're 100 years old. Okay. 
what can you do with what the cards you've got right now? So become a life young, long whippersnapper. Everybody, we coming on the hour. I still got eight more minutes left. I can talk for hours if I have to. I wish I could see your comments right now. I cannot see your comments. Let me see if I move over here. I cannot see any comments over here. Um, no, I don't see any. But I'm I'm not Ursha Metcalf, as you can see. I'm not Ursha. I mean, you can hear my accents differently, but I speak differently to Ursha. And we've all got something to give. You've got something to give. I've got something to give. Ursha's got something to give. And I want to encourage you to, to look at what Ursula's saying, um, you know, what Ursula says about people and about his audience and about his future. So let Ursula speak. So that's why we go to Ursula Speaks. Thank you, everybody. It's, a, it's been a f fantastic day, and I hope this has helped you a little bit. I hope you'll be getting inspired and invigorated to take action, to reposition yourself, to present yourself, and to create the perception that you deserve. Thank you, everybody.